Hello and welcome to the Arts in Conversation. I'm Ben Hartley, Executive Director of the National Arts Club, located here in New York City. For those who are not familiar with the club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and music performances, lectures and readings. At the National Arts Club, we celebrate all art forms, so for this podcast series, each episode dives deeper into one specific medium. Today, our episode is dedicated to the visual arts. While all art forms are indeed showcased here at the club, there has always been a special connection to the visual arts. Many of the leading artists of the early to mid-20th century were members of the National Arts Club and have been honoured with our Medal of Honour dinner, including Robert Henry, Anna Hyatt Huntington and Paul Manship, to name a few. Today our membership continues to include painters, sculptors and others working in the visual arts. Over the years, works from Dali to Warhol to those by contemporary artists such as Lois Dodd and Carlos Quintana have all hung in our public galleries. I grew up in Australia and visual art work that was very much part of my public consciousness as a young child was Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles. This was a work highly creative, highly colourful and to a young child in Australia completely impenetrable. It was a work that got a lot of uh, popular press about it, not all favourable. People say, my child could do this. And so I was very aware of Blue Poles and Jackson Pollock's work, but I wasn't ever aware of his genius. It wasn't until 30, 40 years later that I walked through the Jackson Pollock exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. I went into the first room of the exhibition, and the exhibition, as all exhibitions, is set out in this linear fashion where you progress through the artist's career, the drawings the music that influenced him, the environment he was in. We progress through the exhibition, through the artist's career, until we come to this final room, the room that features Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles. It was truly when I got to that final room that I understood the genius of this artist and was able to take that journey from his very early beginnings and from my early beginnings of understanding art to this final room this quintessential work that has come to define works of genius, works of creativity that at first glance are not transparent to us. That's been my personal journey that has then led to me working at places such as the Guggenheim Museum, the Museum of Arts and Design, and then ended up here at the National Arts Club. To begin our exploration, we're humbled to sit down with a truly inspiring artist. In 1997, as a minor, Halim A. Flowers was sentenced to prison for two life sentences in Washington, D.C. He was released in 2019 under a new juvenile resentencing law. Imprisoned for 22 years, Halim took up artistic practice as part of his healing process. Since then, he's produced a stunning spectrum of paintings and has become a, a true Renaissance man of the arts. He's been featured in exhibitions throughout the country and recently showed his work here at the National Arts Club. Welcome, Halim, to the Arts in Conversation. My name is Halim Abdullah Flowers. I'm a manufacturer of culture, and I produce uh, paintings, poetry, uh, sneakers, fashion, um, everything that I believe that's grounded in an intention to love and doing my advocacy and my activism through product development. Tell us about your story. Where did you start and where are you today? Started in Washington, D.C. Grew up in the 80s, a child of hip hop, a child of Reaganomics. For me, I didn't have any uh, Gordon Geckos in my communities, no, no uh, Michael Milkins. And so what we had were drug dealers. And that's what I aspired to be. And it wasn't that I aspired to be a drug dealer because I thought that it was good or bad. It's just that out of the desperation of poverty, um, even though I took my pre-SATs when I was 11 and was taking collegiate courses at Howard University uh, when I was 11, um, I started selling drugs at the age of 12. It wasn't that my poverty, like I was starving or it's just I was starving for praise. You know, when I went back to the hood, 
and say, man, I score high on my pre-SATs. I'm going to be taking classes at Howard University this summer. It wasn't celebratory by my peers. Uh, no one cared about LSATs or anything of that nature. So me being impressionable and not having a strong sense of love for myself, I, um, I sacrificed who, who I really was, was a nerd, a geek, a creative, a, imaginary person. And I just created this character that became a drug dealer, which led me to going to prison at the age of 16 for something I didn't even do. And I went to trial and I was convicted and given two life sentences as an unarmed aid and a better uh, to felony murder. And the person who actually was indicted and charged as the shooter in the case, they dismissed his case. But I wasn't present when he shot the guy. I was present before, but not when the shooting went down. And I went to trial and I lost. And you know, my journey um, was meant for me. It wasn't meant for me to be raised in my community because the alchemist that I've become, my neighborhood and my community and my family, I now look back, they couldn't prepare me to be the person that's speaking today. So you're an incredible renaissance man. You work in many mediums and produce a wide range of art. This is our visual arts episode. So tell us about your visual art. Can you tell us the stories behind a few of the pieces? Um, and since this is a podcast, tell us, people at home listening to this, what are they going to be looking at when they look at your artwork? For me, a child of hip hop. So I have to go into my creativity started with rapping, freestyle rapping, then going to jail and writing letters, love letters, poems, starting to publish books. And then being an avid fan of Jay-Z, kept hearing him rap about Basquiat. And in prison, <laughs> we don't have access to the internet and smartphones and social media. So Jay-Z is a, is a luxury rapper. So when he's saying Basquiat, I don't know if he's talking about a cigar, you know, a, a designer, a exotic island. And then um, I read an article about John Michelle in the Wall Street Journal. And they didn't have any of his works. It just was a picture of him. I remember thinking like, wow, he's black. I'm like, I never knew that it would be a black artist who was a young, you know, poet like me who just visually really expressed itself through words and his own unique iconography. And I just remember like, I can't wait till I come home from prison so I could see his work. I had the opportunity to be released in 2019 after serving 22 years in prison. So I had a year to travel the world, see different uh, museums, and then COVID came. So I remember right before uh, the quarantine, I went to an opening at a gallery and I was asking the, the dealer how much the works were. He was like 15,000, 15,000. And then I pointed to a broken flat screen that was a part. I said, how much? He said 15,000. And I remember I took that right up back to my wife and I was like, I need to start painting. You know, and then the quarantine happened. And it wasn't just like a commercial desire. It's just like when I saw Basquiat work, and now it's other artists, but like, you know, like Cicely Brown and Kondo and mm -hmm. Jacob Lawrence. It was something about Basquiat's words and me being a writer and a poet, I said, well, let me just start out doing something for quarantine since we're locked down and my income was speaking engagement. So all my income was canceled. And my wife was like, yeah, let's stop at the art store and get some stuff since we're gonna be on lockdown. And I'm used to being on lockdown. I just come mm -hmm. off 22 years of lockdown. So I think when people look at my work, they wanna see a nerd. I, I do it with love. I just approach it from a spiritual place of love and really just conveying what I feel through what I love, which is mathematics, science, you know, empathy, all these different things that's, you know, comics and video games. So I think when people see the work, it's definitely going to be encyclopedic. How is that exhibition here at the National Arts Club? You could feel the love, you could see it. Also incredible range of colors. You use a very broad palette of colors, text, imagery. It was an amazing exhibition. Think back about that and tell us a little bit more about it. When I was in prison, I knew that I would be doing art. I just thought it would be poetry and spoken word. But I knew that I wanted to do it in New York City. And for me to have only been painting 
for not even two years when I had my show and to come in to, to see it, like it was really prestigious in how it was mm -hmm. curated. Mm -hmm. And man, I just, I'm just like real humble, man. Like I'm just humble. Like it moves me to tears because it's like hard to convey to the general public the aesthetic of prison, the the monotone of it, the monotony of the routine, and the reason why my my painters are so colorful because I don't know colors, mm -hmm. and now I can look over um, two years later, and having been blessed to exhibit at galleries and museums, I've seen the evolution of my language, mm -hmm. you know, and and it's been organic. I can't discount the magnitude of having the opportunity to exhibit in New York City at the National Arts Club. I see it as that the, the universe is just giving me an opportunity to be loved and to uh, to share that vibration um, with people who who have different lived experiences, so that we will be comfortable with experiencing. Um, what it's like to look at someone outside of our bubbles with empathy. I got to say, we were the National Arts Club. We were honored to have your show here, your exhibition here, and the impact that it had on our audiences. We have a different audience coming every night mm -hmm. for our public programs, and to see their reactions, to see how they were drawn to different things in your work there, it speaks to you know a multitude of people, mm -hmm. opinions, interests. Um, it was a great experience. For me to see audiences interact with your work. But this is beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for, you for your time. Thanks so much to Halim. Printmaking is essentially the process of creating art by printing on paper, fabric, wood, metal, or other objects. You may know it as etchings, engravings, woodcuts, or lino cuts. The idea behind printmaking is you can make additions. As a collector, this allows you an easier entry point. In printmaking, we introduce the idea of a third partner in the dance of creativity. Normally, we have two creative bodies, the artist and the viewer. In printmaking, we have what is called, in theory, the three-body problem. The idea that if you have two points, you can predict where that end point will be, that third end point. If you have three points, that introduces a randomness, a serendipity, a chance for something else to happen. And that's what printmaking is to me. Our next guests are two accomplished artists located here in New York City, offering their own perspectives on the art of printmaking. First up is Jeremy Ruiz. Jeremy is a printmaker and designer. He's worked at both the Lower East Side Print Shop and the Durham Press, and is currently a contracted silkscreen printer and art director. Welcome, Jeremy. I'm an artist and a printmaker printmaking i think the fact that it's like collaborative and it takes a community and it's done mostly in like a community workshop and of course this is different for all different kinds of artists but like it's not necessarily the painter alone in his or her studio like doing you know something in, in like a solitary place like you need kind of a village in order to um run a print studio because of the facilities it requires in working as a printer like you have to sort of leave your ego behind because when I'm in the print shop and I'm working with another artist, I'm not an artist, right? I'm kind of your technician. I'm, I'm like, we want it to feel like an extension of their studio, right? We want it to be a place that they can come and explore and you need to be able to facilitate that. You know, you, they need to be comfortable. They need to trust you. I think you need to gain trust because you are um, essentially making their work with them. And I think having that, I don't know, sensitivity or, um, having that ability to kind of navigate that dynamic. Everyone that I've ever really worked with in the print shop has been, they have this like willingness for experimentation and like they just really appreciate you as the printer. And yeah, you just get to meet so many different kinds of artists. You get to meet so many different kinds of people from different walks of life. The people is the best thing. Our next guest is Barbara Nessam. Barbara is an artist whose daring and prolific work, spanning six decades, defines narrow categorization. Her artistic production has straddled fine art and illustration, pushing against and reshaping the boundaries of often rigid separation between the two fields. She also happens to be one of our members. 
Here's Barbara. I'm Barbara Nessam. I'm an artist and I work in many different disciplines. I started printmaking in 1959, maybe a little bit earlier than that at Pratt Institute, where I went to school and studied with Fritz Eichenberg. And over the years, uh, six decades, printmaking isn't my main medium even though I'm very interested in it, but I'm interested in so many different things. You know, oil painting, you name it. I love to make art out of it. It's something that I would love to continue doing, but when you get to be in your eighth decade, you think about all the other things you really want to do that you haven't tried yet. (laughs) And there are lots of them. I love learning new things, and I love seeing how I can put myself, my art, my development or whatever I'm going to be doing into the medium that I'm doing and what comes out after it. It's always an experiment to try and do things that are mine, (laughs) you know, and my work always comes out to look like mine, even though I do so many different kinds of art. Now, looking back Over the many, many decades that I was working, you still, from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 2020, it still looks like I did it. And I think to myself, wow, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I'm even amazed that, you know, I'll try anything and make it really whatever, and it'll still turn out looking like I did it. I think all the things that I've done in my lifetime, and I've worked in tremendous amounts of different mediums, I can't say that there's one artist that I met that means a lot to me. I have so many friends that are artists that I love their work. I think they're funny. They're wonderful people. And I have to say that I love my friends. I like to ask questions. I like to know about them. I like to know what they're, what, how they did their process, if they're doing something really interesting. And I don't know, I have a great life. I love my life. And recently I joined the National Arts Club because when you get to be in your eighth decade, uh, you don't, you know people, but you don't meet that many new people. And it's not that easy to kind of go up to somebody. I I don't go to bars, and I don't go to really parties anymore. And not that I went to parties before, although I'd love to salsa dance, but that's not a party. (laughs) It's dancing and having a good time. You get to be in your eighth decade, and a lot of your friends are not here anymore. And I joined because I wanted to know other artists and, you know, people doing whatever. And the National Arts Club, I heard that there are artists here. And so I want to meet them. Thanks to Barbara. In lieu of our traditional member profile, we end this episode by introducing you to three of our National Arts Club Artist Fellows all working in visual mediums. Our Artist Fellows program continues our club's over 120-year history of supporting the arts and artists by granting a select number of artists membership to the historic club with the goal of furthering their careers. The program provides a select number of visual and or performing artists with an 18-month Artist Fellowship at the club. Artists have always been an important part of the National Arts Club, but like many arts organisations, we're always looking for new ways to support artists, bring in new and diverse voices, and encourage creativity. Our Artist Fellow program, now in its third cohort, brings artists into our community. The fellows you'll meet today are Chellis Baird, Jessica Francis Gregoire Lancaster, and Joanne McFarlane. They recently gathered to share some insights into their practices. We welcome them now. My name is Chellis Baird, and I'm a sculptural painter that works in fabric. My textile practice began with re-examining what makes up a painting for me, fabric, paint, and wood, and how I could re-examine each of those materials for myself. Hi, I'm Joanne McFarlane. I'm an artist, a poet, and a curator. I'm artistic director of Art Poetica Project Space in the Guana section of Brooklyn, and there we show works that explore the union of literature and visual arts. 
Hi, I'm Jessica Francis Craigwalk Lancaster. My background's in photography, however, I paint in reverse on glass, um, and the work is informed by vernacular photography, both from my own personal family albums and my personal collection. There was never a decisive moment. Uh, it, it's always been natural to make marks. I haven't ever not had a pencil in my hand or um, framing images um, in my mind. Um, it's just, it's almost a compulsion um, that I just continue to follow. I feel like I've always been an artist. I don't remember any life before that or w without the desire to make things. And I think that artists work so much in isolation, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without an exchange with other artists and other people. I think of art making as a circle, and so I am always thinking about giving something and hopefully getting something back, and so that part is critical to my practice. I think it's just so inspiring to be able to meet other artists and, um, and working in different mediums, and I just find so much um, inspiration from others. Like nothing comes out of a vacuum. So those conversations, even if it's about how you organize your sketchbook or how you approach materials, it, it, it will inform what you do. For me, ordinary conversations will always kind of inform what I do when I get into the studio. So I think it's helpful um, to have a community. Recently, um had a solo exhibition here at the National Arts Club called The Touch of Red, and it was my first time sort of diving into my favorite color, red. I explored different shades of red, um, but focused mostly on one shade produced by MAC Cosmetics that's called Lady Danger, and I just loved that sort of playful um, element to the title, so I also titled some of the works after that. And I know with your show, that feeling of walking into the space and being embraced by that much red, that was very, very fun. Thank you. This was a show I'd always wanted to do, so I'm glad that you had that experience. It was a fabulous counterpoint to everything that was going on in the rest of the club to have this red centerpiece, I guess, almost. It was a pulsating feeling. And it feels very contemporary. So having it in this setting, which is in some ways feels more traditional, was lovely. The contrast was lovely. I had a show open up last week in Detroit um, at Commercial Gallery, and there's a piece included in the exhibition called Whitewash, and it is based off of a photograph of a young girl sitting on top of a, a show horse. and. I obscured her face with white paint, and it, it becomes very much just a Western um, archetype. It's just interesting to see those elements of like high detail in contrast to the like looser mark making. How big is that piece? It is 20 by 20 inches. Do you find it difficult working in a square? No, I love working in a square. Really? Yeah. I find it so hard. No, I, I love can't it. work in squares. <laughs> love a square. Love a square. I think that it's, I mean, all sides are even, um, and so... For me, at least, it's, it's easy to balance out a composition and build that out as opposed to in a rectangle. Um, I mean, I don't work with other forms, really. I used to work with maybe shards of glass, but um, there are technical issues in working with shards of glass and that you have to break it yourself, you have to sand it down. The glass is inherently more fragile than if you had a tempered square. Um, it's just an easier format. It's... Um, you can kind of just lay everything down and get to work as opposed to having to think about other logistics. One of my recent paintings is called Cry Violet, and it's a painting of a dress. And the, the real dress is black, but in the painting it, it just turned out to be violet, which I kind of thought was really cool. Because you described it as black, but it is violet. The real dress is black. Black, okay. But the painting came out. It's beautiful. Uh, it looks like a photograph. It's so yeah. realistic. There's incredible detail. There's that whole, what was it, a few years ago, this argument about was the dress blue or was it oh, yeah. black? <laughs> it's, an, it's a very beautiful way of playing with light, and that's really exciting to see. I think it's so charming. Yeah. What year did you do this in? Oh, I just did that last year. Oh, you did? It's beautiful. Oh, wow. I also find it interesting that all three of our works have a fabric like quality to them. Thanks so much, Chellis, Francis, and Joanne. And thanks to you for listening to this episode of The Arts in Common.
conversation. Our final episode of the season will premiere on July 15th. Be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. The Arts in Conversation is produced by Emily Charish from Charish Sound. Charish Sound produces branded podcasts for businesses. The Arts in Conversation is also produced by Mitch Case from the National Arts Club. We look forward to having you with us again next month.